Thank you for joining us for Shree's Sunday New York Times Read Along. We will be starting in just a minute. Please share, please like, please tag your friends. Thank you for joining us for Shree's Sunday New York Times Read Along. Our guest today is Jeffrey Plout. Jeff Plout has racked up far more wins than losses in applying his political research and public affairs chops on behalf of elected officials, businesses, labor unions, and major nonprofits. He helps clients win elections, high, stake fight, high stakes fights, and major advocacy efforts. His clients have included many members of Congress, national committees, national labor unions, major foundations, and top corporations, including IBM Foundation, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the United Brotherhood of Carpenters, SEIU 32BJ, Columbia University, and General Electric. My name is Neil Parekh. I am the executive producer and guest host of Shree Sunday New York Times Read Along. Please let us know where you're watching from. Please tag your friends in the comments. We are live on Facebook, on Twitter, on LinkedIn, and on YouTube. We are um, excited for a great show today. History was made yesterday. President-elect Biden, Vice President-elect Kamala Harris, those words sound so great to say. Uh, so without further ado, let's... Uh, um, bring on the uh, Upper West Side cam and check in with our host, Sri Srinivasan, the Marshall Loeb Professor at the Stony Brook School of Journalism, the host of the New York Times Read Along and the founder of Digimentors. Sri, how is it looking out there today? It's a beautiful day. It doesn't feel like November, but look at this. Uh, yesterday at this time, about four hours from now, we found out the results and there was pandemonium out here with people making so much noise. It was one of the great memories that I will take with me forever. Absolutely. Uh, what an incredible day yesterday. And we have uh, so many people joining us. Jonathan Borstein from the East Village, where things are quiet for now, which is good. Somewhere down there. Uh, Patricia Freudenberg uh, joining us on LinkedIn. Natasha joining us saying good morning. From Miami. From Miami. Diane Stefani joining us from Margate, New Jersey. Over there where everything is legal. Um, we have Francesca Burks joining us from Ardsley, which is back in the other direction, closer to my hometown of Hastings on Hudson, New York, um, which is where my mom is joining us from. Uh, sorry, my mom. Uh, watching from Hastings on Hudson, and she's offering congratulations to Biden Harris, of course. Uh, I'm trying to show a little bit of the George Washington Bridge. It's all the way in the distance up there, but that's the Hudson River. And there's New Jersey, and that's uh, the George Washington Bridge. And Sudanti is further up this way. Just, just a little bit around the corner. But we are truly a global show. Jasmita Karbatia is joining us from India. Thank you, uh, Jasmeet. And our friend Stefan Kaplan is joining us from Ramsey, New Jersey, northern New Jersey, where it's uh, much sunnier today um, for, for a lot of people. Um, Hannah Wise is joining us from Toronto. Uh, thank you, Hannah. And uh, Roman is joining us from the Dominican Republic. Uh, Linda Lawrence from Long Island. And um, Susan... Uh, Pizneski is joining us. Good morning, uh, Susan. Thank you so much. And our good friend, Pradnia Haldapur from Silver Spring, Maryland. Shree sounds cheerful this morning. Hopefully <laughs> I sound cheerful as well. 
Farad. Yeah, this is, uh, I mean, we're just, we couldn't be more thrilled with, with the news. And um, Shri, what, what does that shirt say? The first, uh, but not the last? Yep, first, but not nice. the last. If you remember, these are the words that uh, Shamala Gopalan, Kamala Harris's mom, uh, said to her that you should always, you know, you, you'll be maybe the first of many things, but make sure you're not the last. Absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, we have a, a great show planned today. Uh, again, uh, we have Jeffrey Plout, who is the uh, uh, a political strategist and consultant. Uh, we certainly have a lot to talk about. Uh, and of course, that front page from the New York Times, which is definitely a keeper. Um, Biden beats Trump. Um, what an incredible day. What incredible um, uh, history, uh, absolutely uh, history that we saw yesterday. So let's go ahead. We will, uh, um, we have the paper right there and uh, we'll um, bring Shri on as well. So we have the paper and Shri. Um, <laughs> Shri, before we, we start, we do want to uh, thank our uh, uh, staff, our team that puts on the read along that brings this to you every week. Um, Shri and I could not do this alone. Uh, we have a great team behind us, Paula Kiger. You can follow her at Big Green Pen, Steve Taylor at Steve Bereave, Julia Weeks at Julia L. Weeks, and Carla Baranakis uh, at Kabara at C A B A R A. One of the great things about the show is that we actually have people in Facebook and in LinkedIn engaging with the audience, sharing links. Um, letting, uh, engaging with, with people, answering questions. A lot of brands just turn on a, a live stream and they don't have anyone there to uh, lead you through it. So thank you very much, uh, Paula, Steve, Julia, and Carla for all the work you do every week to make this show a success. And Shri, uh, we also want to thank our uh, sponsors, um, so let's start with uh, Muckrack. You've been doing a lot of work with Muckrack over the last several months, right? Yes, we have. Um, we created this wonderful course, wonderful not because of me, but because of the amazing content there. Uh, it's a free course that anybody can take, a social media fundamentals course. And these are people uh, with their photographs uh, after they took the... Someone even printed out a certificate, as you can see on the upper left. So it's great to have this, you can all sign in. It's about two hours of work, but you can do it over two days or two months. We also launched a talk show with them called Muckrack Live, and we'll be doing a lot more with them. So please check out Muckrack, and a big thanks to the, our friends at Muckrack. Absolutely, and then we also wanna thank Strategy Focus Group. Uh, in addition to Muckrack, uh, we, we have a partner in Strategy Focus Group they are a global team of human capital strategists committed to helping organizations solve people issues within your organization. They do that by working alongside you to solve your toughest problems and helping you capture your greatest opportunities. You can learn more about Muckrack and uh, Strategy Focus Group uh, by following these links. If you go to readalong.link slash muckrack or readalong.link slash strategy focus group, and if you're interested in being a sponsor, please reach out to either Shri or myself. You can reach Shri at uh, his email address, Shri at digimentors.group, or myself, Neil at digimentors.group. Uh, we would be uh, happy to work with you and find a, a package that suits your needs. Um, so with that, Shri, um, why don't we take a look at what's in the paper and uh, then bring on our guest. I think we have uh, you know, just an incredible uh, incredible news to share, right? Yeah, so much to discuss. And uh, big thanks to everyone who's watching. Thank you for all the comments that have already come in. I see Brian's watching from Florida and so many other folks on LinkedIn, on Twitter, on YouTube, uh, and on Facebook. Please tag your friends now. They can join us live or later. If this is too early in the morning for them, they can watch uh, later. So first, I just wanted to show you Saturday's paper was Biden vaults ahead in Pennsylvania, which opens path to the White House, and then this historic page. And we will discuss this with our guest in just a minute. 
I just wanted to see what else is in the paper. There's a whole section called Election 2020, which will look at arts and leisure smashing, crashing, and taking up space. Uh, watching female action stars made our critics think differently about bodies and self-image as we all celebrate the first female vice president in U.S. history. Other countries have had the equivalent of presidents, but we've never had even a vice president. So big, big day and big news for America. The real estate cover is the pandemic is hitting co-ops in the pocket and a tiny house has grown up. The New York Times Magazine, when the virus came for the American dream. And this is about a suburb in Atlanta. We'll be talking a lot about Georgia for the next two months. And I know Jeff, our guest, will have lots of thoughts on that. And by the way, uh, as I understand it, and Jeff will correct me, that anyone can move to anyone who's living in the state of Georgia by something like December 15th can register to vote in the big two uh, Senate races that are coming up. So watch for that. The book review is about Dickens' world. And uh, the Sunday review cover is What Lies Ahead. Uh, lots of comments and uh, folks are still uh, discussing uh, the the big win. I see Marielle has joined us from Kansas City. Hi, Marielle. Great to have you here with us as well. The Sunday business cover is Paradise Botch. Digital nomads move to exotic locales to work through the pandemic in style. It hasn't gone as planned. Bankruptcy isn't an easy fix for student debt. Last two sections, we have the at-home section. First, I thought this might be the Four Seasons landscaping building, which we saw in the news yesterday, but it's not. This is about, we are letting the kids lead sometimes. And I know you might be doing that occasionally at home, Neil, with your seven-year-old. And the Sunday Styles cover, actually, maybe, yes, on the war on, as the war on drugs loses its allure, voters across the U.S. are backing decriminalization. So... That's a big, big uh, story where we have seen, you know, we focus so much on the national presidential race, but there's so much else was on the ballot in different states. And I'm sure Jeff has some thoughts on that as well. And the afterlife of our discarded CDs. The, these relics of the 90s can be turned into carbonate flakes, but who's buying? Uh, fascinating. And then I don't know what this is. More than the mayor of hell. Elijah Daniels' career can be a guide for succeeding in digital media today. All right, so let's uh, look at the front page and let's uh, have Jeff come on and say hello when you're ready. Uh, hi, hi, Jeff. Good morning. Hi, Sri. Nice to be with you and to be with everybody. It's quite a day. Yeah, we're going to uh, introduce you properly to everyone. But in the meantime, tell me what you see when you see this cover. Um. I see history um, in a very big way, and I see a um, America um, embracing you know the better angels of its nature rather than the um, uh, rather than the reverse. Um, and I see tremendous uh, and feel um, hope and optimism, um, even sitting within the kind of you know, tremendous concern uh, that we have. And what do you see in this map? Well, I see a deeply divided America and I feel one too. And I know we're gonna talk about it. I've been on the campaign trail and my colleagues have been. Um, I also see those states of Michigan and Wisconsin and Pennsylvania, which were the late night in 2016, which made Donald Trump president. Um, now moving around, and um, I look at the state of Georgia there, um, waiting to be called, still to be filled in, and uh, I think very much that, um, I think a lot about Stacey Abrams, um, and that a person, a, an individual person, can really have a very, very broad effect, um, because she took the pain of her own loss in a very close race where many voters were disenfranchised, and, uh, and then went to work. Um, so I, I, I see that too. Um, and, and three others have mentioned this, but when I look at that map, there's some of those areas, you know, Philadelphia and what it's meant to the United States from, from our beginning, uh, Georgia where John Lewis 
Con the late John Lewis, Congressman John Lewis was from, and then out to Arizona, which is also being filled in there. And thinking about, you know, Senator John McCain, a prominent Republican, their nominee for president, who's uh, the late John McCain, who's um, uh, took a departure from the current direction of the president and the Republican Party and endorsed Joe Biden. And I think a lot about him and, and uh, that, too, when I see that man. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, let's hear a little bit of your story and your work. You know, when we hear political strategist and consultant, it is kind of vague enough that we can inject our own, project our own thoughts on what you do. And right. uh, tell us also, so what you do and also what is the difference between a strategist, a consultant and an operative? Great. So so I'm a, uh, a partner at a political consulting firm, which I helped found. It's called Global Strategy Group. We work um, domestically in the United States for Democrats, um, big D Democrats um, only. That's different. We're somewhat different than some of the lobbyists who work back and forth. Um, and we help Democrats get elected. Um, and I'm a pollster. I used to say that to everybody. And it was like, oh, that's so exciting. Why don't you ever call me or, or, or why don't you ever text me now or online? And um, my, one of my brothers uh, is a lawyer. And it used to be that lawyer was a little bit of a bad word to say. But now I know um, people have mixed feelings about pollsters, too. So we can talk about that. And we are retained usually in every campaign, both Democrats and Republicans. There's someone who produces the media and the television. We do the kind of polling, which is survey research and other kinds of research tools to help guide the messaging. Um, um, and then there's a campaign manager. Um, and that's kind of what we do. We also work for a, a range of kind of what I would call campaign adjacent kinds of groups, unions, advocacy groups, uh, super PACs. And as many of your viewers know, in the United States, there's now as much campaign activity, which is generated outside of the individual campaigns as there is um, in the campaigns. And so we're, we're involved um, in that too. And I would say of your question on what's the difference between the words, you know, um, strategist is what you tell your parents you are. It kind of sounds nice. And I guess you can, you know, you can say it more in a house of worship or somewhere else. Um, consultant, I think, reflects the business part of it that and, and our role that, you know, I'm not a campaign manager um, going from state to state and running campaigns. And so we do, um, you know, many campaigns each cycle. Um, and operative, I would say, is the word most embraced within the kind of culture of politics. So sometimes even um, people who are really proud of the work will kind of self-describe as hacks you know, which feels like kind of a negative word or almost even a pejorative, um, yet within the culture of campaigns, um, you know, it, it's almost said in a, in a kind of um, a, a tone of camaraderie that a campaign operative or even a campaign hack. So those are the people who are really grinding, you know, and they're Democrats and Republicans. You know, that's the group who are now going down to Georgia to be down there all week, who next year, when all this is over, will go to New Jersey or Virginia or other races around the country. So that's what I would say the operatives are. Excellent, thank you. Let's look at some of the questions here. When, uh, question for Jeff, uh, with this many mail-in ballots, doesn't that dramatically affect exit polling? All these stats about how Trump got 20% of the black vote, is that accurate? Isn't that based on exit polling in person? So this is one of, I'm sure, many questions that people are gonna be asking you. Folks, jump in, please post your comments and questions as a chance to ask all kinds of political questions of Jeff. So go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, so so exit polling has had huge problems. When I started uh, in the business, they would be released, you know, the exit polls during the day, actually. And, you, you know, they were only calling around who's got the five o'clock exits. Um, and they've had, you know, some really, really uh, difficulties. An exit poll is kind of an after the vote poll. As someone's walking out, you select a random select of people who come out of the polling place who do you uh, vote for and ask them for a bunch of questions. This year, the exit polls were not really exit polls. They were kind of pre-polls, very big. Um, and they were done by a mix of, um, of telephone interviewing um, and um, uh, online methodology. So they were not kind of classic uh, exit polls where people were stationed at um, uh, voting spots around the country and talk to people as they come out. Um, I would say the exit polls, I think, can be quite helpful 
in terms of some directional sensibilities about America, but I would be careful in looking at them for um, for for kind of composition of electorate kinds of questions because the exit poll imposes a model of what they think the electorate's going to be. So do we interview, you know, how many people do we interview in these kinds of places and in these kinds of places? And when they, um, um, and so they're kind of what the electorate is composed of uh, can be wrong. And I saw at the bottom of the question, there was um, something about um, uh, the black vote in the country. Um, uh, he meant the black male vote is what he meant to say. Yeah. The black male vote. Um, um, and then there'll be discussion about that. Black voters were overwhelmingly for Biden. Um, uh, um, there was, uh, Trump did make a play um, um, on two things. Um, um, you know, I, I think you, we, you heard Trump um, talking about um, black unemployment a good deal. Um, I, I suspect it struck many ears as very inauthentic um, and kind of felt um, 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 very kind of uh, gratuitous and awkward, but he um, was making an actual play um, to black voters um, uh, based on kind of uh, economic issues. I think when the story of this election or the big story or the headline story um, will be that black voters overwhelmingly supported the Biden-Harris ticket and are a key part of the coalition. But I do think there is a, um, uh, look, nearly a, a lot of the country voted for Donald Trump. And um, that's a story we need to kind of deal with. The Senate um, is going to come down to two races in Georgia, which are um, will be, uh, um, you know, coming around the corner. Um, in the House will be uh, Democratic, uh, Pelosi led, but by a narrower margin. So I think that there is a real story of um, what does this say in, about the country that we're all in, um, and, um, um, and and how does that shake itself out? Um, so it was a it was a win and a historic win and an important one, um, but it was. Um, uh, you know, we waited four days for it because it was close, as everybody knows, and um, we're all living. Sure. Then. So thanks to Andrew for that question. Andrew is a co-founder of our company, DigiMentors, which does conferences and talk shows and virtual events. So anyone who's working on those, please contact us. We'd love to work with you. We've done events for 50 people and 100,000 people. So somewhere in between is your event, I presume. And so we can help you with that. I also wanted to make a correction. Carla Baranakis on our team has pointed out that I said it was December 15th is the deadline to move to Georgia. But the answer is actually earlier. It's December 7th. And anyone who's 18 by the date of the US Senate runoffs in Georgia is eligible to vote in that election. December, 17th, December 7th is the registration deadline. People, people can register if they're 17 and a half. So people who uh, are in Georgia can vote that uh, on, on January uh, uh, 5th. Someone needs to look up the date of the election, uh, 5th or 6th, something like that. So do you expect some people will be moving down there or reactivating their Georgia residency or um, students who are at, say, Emory who are, or Georgia Tech who went home will come back to vote? Do you think things like that will happen? Um, I, I think uh, the student voting, I think, is a huge one to pay attention to in the COVID era and and, um, and uh, what those ru rules are. I don't know what the rules are if you, if you haven't already registered in terms of registering at this point um, um, for Georgia. I think moving in the COVID era, um, probably not so much. I mean, it's most Americans are not in a position to be able to kind of leave where they are, especially in this era and for economic reasons. I do think, um, I do think that um, I was involved in a Senate race, um, which kind of um, was one of the kind of early experiences which led me to this work or kind of deepened my involvement, which was for Harvey Gantt, African-American mayor of Charlotte, North Carolina, who ran against Jesse Helms um, um, in North Carolina for the United States Senate. And there was thousands um, of young people in a real community, I think that will happen on both sides for these races, is that 
there will be a descending um, on Georgia. I've already gotten you know four or five texts from different friends in different ways. Do you want to go to Georgia? I'm, I want to go to Georgia. How do we do it? Kind of when we go to Georgia, and I think there, that that kind of clarion call um, will happen, um, and will lead and leads to some interesting questions about this historically high turnout that we just had. You know, how will that play itself out in Georgia with Trump no longer on the ballot? You know, and as the central organizing kind of factor in our politics. How will that play itself out? But, you know, it's going to be all eyes or at least all political eyes um, turning to Georgia. And I think there's going to be a lot of, um, you know, Shri, we were at a historic this election in terms of voter turnout, but also in terms of um, donations and giving. And we have a question in polls that we ask is, um, uh, how excited are you to vote in this election? Or sometimes we ask it, how motivated are you to ask in this election? The Republicans would report very, very high levels of excitement. And so we would get, um, um, on a scale of zero to 10, we would get, you know, 90% reporting, you know, eight to 10 and 85% saying nine or 10. Um, the Democrats would report very high excitement, but even higher motivation. So when we use the kind of motivation as a scale, um, and, and that was off the roof. So I think that that will kind of continue. And, and for me, for if you say, and I'm a little bit of a, glass is half full guy and a glass is half empty profession. So that's kind of reflects my, you know, probably my poorly suited for the what work I've chosen. But when I saw kind of around the country, you know, the election, people waiting in line, I was in Gorham, Maine for Biden and the Senate uh, candidate, Sarah Gideon there um, at a polling site. Um, and, you know, people kind of, um, you could tell that people got there early the lines went around around the corner. You know, at the end of the night, <clears throat> like in many places, that polling place, the day of electorate was more Trump. You know, I, well, I, opened, I was there when they opened the, um, you know, when they counted the ballots and it was a thousand votes for Trump and about 500 for um, Biden in a place that the early was overwhelmingly Biden. Um, but I do think that um, if there's plenty of signs that American democracy is in a lot of trouble. But I think the tremendous turnout in this election is a very good sign that there's still a very, you know, deep hopefulness in America um, that we can, you know, go in the right direction. Let's look at some of the comments that have come in. Terry Thompson's watching in Las Vegas where it's very early. Uh, and Andrew is congratulating her and saying thank you for doing your part in Nevada for the uh, for the election. Uh, we also saw a comment from our friend Rao, who's watching in Warsaw. Poland and congratulating us in America. I think the worldwide response to this has been a, a, a huge sigh of relief. Even the folks, even the countries where their leaders did a lot of work with Trump and engaged him at a, you know, because they had to, they just, there's going to be just a lot more stability and predictability of, uh, about the U.S. presidency. And that's important for the world. It sure was, Shri, and to see world leaders come in, it kind of reminds us, you know, um, about the importance of the United States um, around the world and the, um, um, you know, the deep response. I think there is a kind of quality when you're watching these returns. And um, I, my friends were all calling me and texting me about Maricopa County, you know, many of whom I don't think had ever been there, <laughs> um, you know, about we're kind of watching it. It feels in some respects felt there was a certain loneliness to it. I almost felt watching the returns and then to kind of see the response yesterday, the kind of public um, um, uh, uh, excitement and then the, the, the experience around the world, I, it felt very connecting to me. I don't, I don't know for others, but kind of um, in this era when we're kind of alone for so many things because of COVID and how we're living um, um, and how deeply we divi are divided in this country, it did feel like a very warm embrace from the rest of the world for not only for Joe Biden, but for, I think for the, you know, the idea of America um, uh, in some ways. I completely agree. And here's Ron Thomas. Good evening from Dubai. Such a wonderful day. Ron was at this table in January. It was a different time where we were together. He read the paper with us. He's one of our sponsors. We're so grateful to have him in our community. 
but this international focus of this election, because I think people really understood what is at stake. And we, we saw that. So that's great. We see lots of uh, comments coming in. Debbie, Debbie says, Kamala's win. That's one step for a woman of color and a giant leap for all womankind. And let me just show my T-shirt again, if it can, if it can fit on the screen there. It says, uh, the first but not the last. This was uh, what uh, uh, Kamala Harris's mom had said to her, that you may be the first of many things, but make sure you're not the last, meaning give everybody an opportunity, bring people up behind you. And it says Biden Harris on the back of this T-shirt. And so this was a good day to pull out that shirt. And uh, just so, I, I mean, I'm so happy and relieved. Some of you who have known me for many, many years uh, might be surprised about how clear cut I was uh, all throughout this and critical about my, about Donald Trump. You know, as uh, a journalist trained to be, uh, you know, play things down the line and, uh, and be balanced and all of that, I knew because I had become less of a daily reporting kind of guy, I'm now an opinion journalist, commentator more than anything else, but I was so upset about the handling of the coronavirus above everything else. And I blame Donald Trump and his administration and many governors around this country for their failure to control the virus. You know the famous story of how Korea, South Korea and America got the virus on the same day. And while they were approaching 500 deaths, we're approaching 200,000 deaths, where Japan uh, had, hasn't had in its entire, all, all these months, the same number of cases as we had two days ago in one day. The, this, these kinds of statistics make me so angry because of the personal cost to millions of Americans who, are, who have uh, suffered as their family members have died, as people have gotten sick, and as the economy has gotten into so much trouble. So I wonder... Uh, uh, Jeff, if you can kind of share your thoughts on what role the coronavirus played in his loss. I've been saying that this shows you that if it weren't for coronavirus, Trump would have been re easily reelected. But many people have said that's wrong. So I'm, I'm curious about your thoughts. Yeah, thanks, Sri. Well, let me kind of take it from a different perspective or a related perspective. And that is early in March when uh, coronavirus started to really hit and hit, you know, the New York City where I, you know, work and have lived much of my life in New Jersey where I now am, you know, very hard. And we, we're all trying to figure out what to do. And um, many of us, um, maybe most of us lost, you know, loved ones or friends and colleagues. Um, I remember thinking, you know, of course, because I'm a political consultant, we always talk about the politics. I remember thinking and talking with some colleagues who I worked with on one of those early Zooms where, you, you know, you couldn't figure out the mute button or I couldn't. Um, younger people could. Um, and I said, you know, if um, Donald Trump is a C minus president through COVID, he'll be reelected now. I mean, I, I because Americans um, rally around the leader in times of crisis and are willing to. Um, uh, what I thought were the authoritarian tendencies in Trump will get much more kind of um, license in a time when there's such a public health disaster. And um, no one will say that he caused this and nor will the response have to be great. It just has to be, you know, I'm the president and in a, in a crisis. And as a New Yorker, you know, in a different era, you know, when um, after 9-11 with Rudy Giuliani, the kind of popularity of Rudy Giuliani and even of George Bush in those moments, um, and after Superstorm Stan Sandy of governors like Chris Christie, Republican governor, I was sure that it would be a, um, Trump would step in in kind of a, you know, an authoritarian way and tell people, I'm gonna tell you a bunch of things or the health experts are gonna tell you a bunch of things you're not going to like any of them. I don't like any of them, but we're American. And for, you know, in, in, a, in such a chaotic, botched response, there were a few days where he kind of latched onto this idea, which is, I thought he was going to stay there, and I thought he would go there, that America's at war with the virus, and we're on wartime footing. We tend to use this language of war, which I'm not crazy about, but I think does work pretty well. 
And I thought he would stay there and that that's what he would do. Um, so it, it is incredible to me, Shree, the way that, um, um, you know, masks became a partisan issue or presented that way and you know, became associated with um, uh, not wearing them with a certain brand of Trumpism and a certain brand of maleness and gender. And it was um, kind of, um, you know, unbelievable to me. I will say that um, for voters who were um, um, said that they, uh, uh, for Biden, um, COVID and coronavirus was a huge issue. Um, um, I think, and it also, because it affected the economy so greatly, that was Trump's single best argument. And um, I think it made it much harder for him to say, you know, I don't agree with the argument, but it is a strong argument when he says um, the economy was was doing well. Um, and that was the perce perception. I know many will say, well, it, who was it doing well, et cetera. But Americans overall running on the economy prior to COVID would have been a strong argument. And I think what Trump did say on the economy, it was going well. Um, and I'm the guy to lead it again was a pretty good argument. But it, ha it was put under tremendous pressure by the fact of the botched COVID response um, made it seem, you know, many people said, well, how does this work? Because even when we can go back to restaurants, people aren't going to go back in many parts of the country or not go back fully until they're confident that they're not going to get a um, catch the virus, which can affect them or their families. So I think it broadly permeated. Um, 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 but in some ways, the kind of economic, it also underlined um, how much Trump was was in a position, despite everything that he did and said, and um, to um, win this election based on a um, the economy was in pretty good shape, or I'm the best person for the economy. Thank you so much, Jeff. Folks, what a great conversation this is, and we're we're going to about to we're going to be about to read the newspaper and uh, talk about the day's news and so much more. So please tag your friends. Please hit share. We're live on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and on LinkedIn. We'd love to have you share this with uh, folks. Shri, we uh, lost your audio on your cam. Um, I will jump in, Shri. Uh, we are about to start the paper, and as we sometimes do, we have uh, technical issues. We still can't hear you, Shri. So uh, why don't we uh, uh, take off, uh, unmute your, there we go. And um, just have to unmute your mic there. Uh, sorry about that, folks. I got a there call go. on WhatsApp, and that's why you lost me. <laughs> so I will, no uh, I will just reaccess my, my. Uh, paper uh, camera for the for the newspaper, but I just want to ask Jeff. There are a couple of comments that have come in that are worth um, you, just looking at and uh, and just showing Jeff's uh, response. One of them is from uh, one of the comments is uh, uh, I'm I'm looking here from che Shelley Chabra who says, "Do we need to be worried about an uptick in Republicans winning more governors' races in the near future as a response to the election?" They have, ten, in fact, this time they won a, a big majority of the governor's races. Um, yeah, I would say, Shri and, and Shelley, thanks for the question. Um, I think Trump and Trumpism and the elements of the country and what that meant or does mean and meant is not going away in the United States. So, and I don't, I don't want to at all be the one who throws water on a you know very exciting hopeful time but i think the concerns that you mentioned both in our politics in our culture in our soul if a country does have one all those things still exist at a very fundamental level in the united states um and how they're going to play themselves out in the politics to come you know re remain to be seen so you know, yesterday was a huge moment, you know, as big as could be 
Um, but there are still, you know, very um, deep um, and concerning impulses in the United States, which I think were given, you know, uh, um, great license and um, encouragement and incitement in the Trump era. They won't get that in a, in a, in a Biden era. But, um, you know, they're still there. And a lot of Americans, um, many of them in person because they're Republicans, but pulled the lever uh, for Donald Trump and for um, Republican Senate candidates um, and down ballot, as you kind of mentioned. So from a political uh, perspective, um, we are um, um, there is a, you know, at least a strong chance that we're going to have divided government coming up, depending on what happens in the races um, in Georgia. All right, let's take a look at the paper. Uh, of course, the front page we already saw, Harris will become the country's first female vice president. And uh, she wore uh, her white pantsuit uh, in part uh, to reflect suffragist white, but I'm sure also a nod to uh, Hillary Clinton and her pantsuit nation. Uh, let's go inside the paper on this day in history. House and Senate override veto by Nixon to curb uh, on curb of war powers. And this is where uh, it's so important to have, as you were saying, uh, not a divided house, right? To have as much of the uh, of, of the gov the the reins of government as possible. Reopening is a boon for tourism, but locals object in Hawaii. That's an unusual story. And I want to read that. If anyone's read it, please tell us what that's about. Six White House aides, the chief of staff included, received positive tests. So problematic that they have the ultimate, uh, you know, sign of how badly they've handled it is how badly they've dealt with it themselves. And that's so sad to see. All right, uh, let's go in here. Israeli CEOs and Emirati investors click in the desert. Early sign in Dubai of warmer relations. And there was uh, that President Trump tried to use Netanyahu uh, to say bad things about Biden in the days leading up to the election, but he did not. But Netanyahu, Netanyahu did not and was one of the first leaders to congratulate Biden yesterday. And uh, Jeff, just jump in if you have thoughts on any of these stories. Yeah, or yeah, well, the last one you said, I saw Israeli investors going, and I think, look, um, that's an, an area. Um, Errol Margolit from Jerusalem Venture Partners was actually a client of mine at one point. Um, and, um, um, you know, that is an area. If you said, well, where were the areas um, in America where Trump might try to make progress from an electoral perspective um, uh, with groups of voters, he did try to pull. It's not progressive Jewish voters um, uh, in places, but um, around Israel and around um, issues around. Uh, Israel and, and got very tied in with Netanyahu, as you kind of mentioned. Um, but I think that that will be a continuing, um, you know, big question now. What is the um, Biden in the Middle East um, kind of region uh, look like? And there's right, Raul Margulit, who, like many Israelis, um, um, it's kind of funny. One of the, I mean, one of the cultural things of Israelis or secular Israelis is that they're all um, uh, basketball fans and players. And um, they all, um, every Israeli man between the ages of uh, uh, 30 and 50, I met, said that they almost played professional basketball. And Arel was one of those, too. So. <laughs> and he was your client, you said. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We're some ventures partners. He's, uh, yeah. And uh, this is the view from the Burj Khalifa. Um, some of you know that my, because I mentioned it on previous episodes, my brother lives in Dubai. And we're, you know, one of the things that I've not been able to do is see my family in India see my family in Dubai. Uh, fear grips college campus in Hong Kong as political debate is muted. Uh, amid uh, rows of classics along the Seine, a sad ending in the making. I'm not sure what this is. Iconic hawkers of the printed word struggle to outlast a lockdown. So I guess uh, bookstores and uh, magazine stores are in trouble. Cuba braces for floods as storms. I would just have a story, Sri, about you know, it's a little bit of a media story. I know there's there's a lot of uh, people who are interested, and of course you are. Um, I do think one of the lessons or things is, you know, how we get information. I mean, Donald Trump, you know, the importance of Twitter and the political connection between our politics, our democracy, and how we're getting information, you know, increasingly 
not on this show or from this audience, but in these kind of shorter forms, um, I do think has had an effect or has had an accelerant effect on um, uh, Americans' increasing tendency to um, retreat to partisan camps where more, more and more of us talk to people who think like we do, get our information um, from people who uh, think or sound like we do. And on that earlier story where you mentioned, you know, back in the Nixon days, uh, which was, a, you know, a long time ago, but was kind of just as I was starting to become aware politically, uh, Nixon's impeachment uh, or, or actually happened when Republican senators, um, when he lost Republicans. So, you know, he lost Democrats earlier, but when Republicans started to go to him and say, Mr. President, you know, you got to go and we're done, um, that was the kind of change there. And when you think about this era, um, you know, uh, about how infrequent it was for Republican voices to take departure, you know, from Donald Trump. They, there were a few, McCain, um, uh, um, some, some senators who are no longer around. Jeff Flake, so, yeah. Yeah, Flake, um, um, Corker in Tennessee, I guess, a little bit. Um, but that, um, um, you know, so few um, uh, Republicans have staked out a different position. And so, you know, early on from a political perspective, you know, in 2016, I can remember, you know, early on, it was like, well, Bush will win the Republican nomination after, you know, Trump came down the stairs and, um, you know, unleashed on Mexico in a hateful way. It was like, well, Bush will win. And then it was, well, Marco Rubio will win. And then it was the leaders in the Congress will stand up to him. Um, and so I do think um, you know, we have to deal with the reality that we actually have it, which is that the Republican Party is a Trump party right now. Um, and I think that's going to be one of their big challenges is what does the Republican Party look like um, in a Biden uh, presidency? And, um, you know, there have not been that many of them, as I'm seeing Andrew's mentioning, who have um, congratulated Biden, although Romney did and some House members. Um, and so how much um, does this, I don't, it's, they're not required, you know, the, um, the congratulatory phone call at the end of a campaign or the kind of, we're all Americans, let's move on. That's not required in our democracy, but it does provide a really helpful lubricant, um, which kind of helps us avoid some of these kinds of um, really difficult kinds of questions or, or as we go along. Um, um, so I think that's a really big kind of question. Is there a Republican Party? When Joe Biden says last night, um, you know, he wants to um, um, give each other a chance, I think were his words. Um, 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 you know, when you reach your hand out to shake someone else's hand in the pre-COVID era, someone else has to extend a hand. And I do think that's a open, I'm sure Joe Biden's going to extend a hand, and he's pretty good at it. And I suspect he'll try to figure out how Susan Collins in Maine or Lisa Murkowski or some Republicans who he would need, um, he will spend a lot of time with because he'll need to, especially if we don't have the majority. But um, um, I think that's a very open question. What does the Republican Party look like now in America in the post-Trump era? Sure. I'm looking at Jim Roberts, our guest from uh, from last week, who was here, former New York Times uh, editor, uh, he on his Twitter feed, he has put a list of the things that Biden will, by executive order, change on January 20th. He'll rejoin the Paris Climate Accords, rejoin the World Health Organization, repeal the travel ban on Muslims and reinstate dreamers. What do you think about this idea of using executive orders? Uh, is there any downside to that? Well, I think those are hugely important things which he should do. I think the downside is that, you know, he requires Senate confirmation for, um, you know, certain appointees and he's going to have to deal with the Senate on those. Um, and that um, um, the two big things, which I think he'll probably do and, and uh, is we need to do a COVID relief package and he's going to, um, have to deal with the Senate and we'll deal with the Senate on that, whatever the composition of the Senate is. Um, and I think, I think Biden will be inclined to do an infrastructure package, 
um, and he'll be in, inclined to deal with the, um, uh, the the Senate on that. So I think things by executive order are going to be, there's going to be a group of things which are, um, and Jim's put a bunch of them there, which are kind of part of who Biden has been all the way through. And he can do those, but he's not going to be able to do, you know, um, it's a narrower range of policy that you can deal with. And he's got to deal with the budget and other things with the Republicans. So I don't think that there's a way or a great way. I don't think it's a substitute for, um, for reaching out, which is the broad sensibility. And I think we do have a political challenge, which is that we are deeply divided in a way that I think is hurtful um, to America beyond any specific policy agenda. And I think kind of uh, um, reaching out and trying to refashion in a really, really difficult time, a new American consensus is really, really important. And I will say, look, um, there will be powers that we have, um, but you know, we're also gonna have another election in two years. And the general trend is that the president's party loses seats in the off-year elections. Um, and so besides everything else, Biden does and will have to have um, a feel for where this is going to go uh, in two years. All that being said, you know, my experience um, is generally that the first year of presidencies and executives, governors too, and mayors, is usually the year to do um, big things. And so... Okay, um, we're just looking at some of the comments here. Uh, Esley Thompson says, uh, glad to hear Jeff's perspective on this monumental election. And you see Jeff's Twitter handle there. So please follow uh, Jeff as well. Great to uh, have everybody here. In um, Richard asks, in what ways has Trump permanently recast the executive? While you're answering, we'll just show the paper as you're, as you're talking there. Um, uh, what ways has Trump permanently recast uh, the executive? Well, um, I think the way he just put through a Supreme Court justice, um, which, um, you know, um, uh, after what the Republicans did on uh, Merrick Garland, I think the, um, the idea or the Trumpian sense that um, winning in the moment is not only the major thing, but the kind of only thing. Um, um, I think kind of walking away from um, America's role in the world. Um, I think the fomenting of a, um, a sensibility that America is a zero sum. Um, you know, um, I think all our profound changes of, of the Trump era. Um, um, you know, when whether I, I'm not a political scientist, and so it's going to be for others and for history um, to kind of write what 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 was the effect of all this, um, and and how much of this what just happened in the last four years was you know um, an aberration um, versus kind of a strand of America which has always been with us and which was given um, greater license. So. I, um, so the answer is I don't fully know like what the presidency um, uh, will look like, what the kind of um, you know the autopsy report on um, our institutions. I, I've been heartened um, by the participation in democracy, by the the voting, by the resistance, by the willingness of Americans, um, uh, by the um, uh, Black Lives Matter and social justice. And racial justice, um, uh, by the importance of Senator Harris and all those things, but they sit um, within an America which, at the end of the Trump era, Biden won a very narrow victory. Um, so um, I, I think we've got um, lots of work to do. And I think one of the things will be is how much have Americans um, and uh, progressives and Democrats um, how much do we all remain engaged and involved um, um, going forward? Because I don't think this is a win in an election and, um, um, you know, um, somehow hope that this, these impulses in American life are 
gone, you know, forever. They're going to, they're here and we have to kind of you know, deal with them with great vigilance. And uh, we should point out that this was just what we were talking about, about top Republicans remaining silent, even after the very conciliatory speech by Biden last night. And I think Lisa Markowski has issued a statement that I think is uh, uh, favorable, but otherwise uh, everybody else on the list, uh, only one senator, uh, uh, Mitt Romney and the other uh, Republican Congress folks uh, would be, uh, I think, considered kind of never Trumpers by the Trump administration. So they wouldn't have any impact or as much impact as people think they might. You know, Sri, um, one of the interesting things in the exit polls I saw was um, they asked a question, um, are you, would you, would, how would you feel if you, not your candidate won for president? You know, you could say, I'd be okay. I'd be concerned. I'd be very concerned. I'd be scared. Scared was the top response of, and um, about 35% of Democrat uh, Biden supporters said that they would be scared if Trump won re-election. I mean, I was, you know, chose that word, um, which for me, you know, I, that felt very like, oh, I, I know and hear from many people who say that and, um, you know, who've had um, kind of fear, anxiety, um, uh, kind of very, very deep emotional response, um, you know, in certain ways. And it's one of the things that I miss about in this COVID era is that um, seeing people's in, in the kind of focus group research or in person, seeing people respond and seeing last night when Kamala Harris came out and um, uh, African-American women crying and joyful in, a, in the full emotional range. But that fear is very real. I will also say 25 percent of Republicans who voted for Donald Trump said that they were scared if Joe Biden had got to be president. And that struck me because that was like I was like, wow. You know, um, it's not just this kind of deep division is not just um, the way that, you know, head scratchingly, you kind of say, how could we have responded to COVID the way we did? And how would anyone have voted for Trump at this point? Um, I think there are many Republicans in parts of the country who are genuinely scared and concerned today um, um, about Biden. And I, that is the problem with such a deeply divided country um, um, where we, um, our ability to talk and understand each other is really, really under pressure. And I, I'm not suggesting a kumbaya moment or that, you know, why can't we just get along or that there aren't things worth fighting for, but only as, as we kind of catalog our own uh, fear, many of the things that have happened, and, and, and they have happened, those things in the executive order, um, you know, there, there are shameful things in there. The Muslim ban is a shameful, shameful aspect of America. But there are people on the other side um, who are deeply scared, too. And I think that's one of the things that Biden feels like, you know, presidents tend to be a response to who came before them. And the kind of fundamental decency, and, and I would even say, and others may quibble, but American decency of Biden, um, I, I, I do think is a very comforting quality that um, I think he has broad ability to reach out. And we need the president to do that, even when he's going to reach out at times and his open hand is not going to be taken, but he ought to keep doing it over and over because I think it's important for the country. And um, the other side's not going anywhere. They're not disappearing. They're going to, you know, there's going to be Trump TV. They're going to kind of, you know, they're, they're not going anywhere. Trump TV, that's all we need. Yeah. Uh, we, we kind of lived Trump TV for the last four years. Sure uh, we have lots of comments coming in. Rick says Trump lost the battle of the election, but the war on Trumpism is not over. The war will reignite after Biden's election. Laura says there's plenty of work to do. Still, let's celebrate a particular bright point. Biden, men Biden mentioning people with disabilities in a speech last night, a vast overlooked piece of the electorate. I also read that he mentioned uh, the transgender community the first time a uh, presidential uh, president elect has mentioned the transgender community in that kind of setting. So uh, um, we have lots to read in the paper, but let's take a couple of questions. 
what damage, if any, can Trump do in the remaining 73 days? <laughs> okay. Um, this feels a bit dystopian. Um, uh, uh, I, I think there is... Um, uh, he'll pardon a lot of people, I would think. So if you care about that, um, other presidents have too. That wouldn't be singular, but um, he could do that. Um, he can um, uh, lead us on adventures in other parts of the world. I think there would be a, you know, very reluctant Congress or military for that. Um, but he can um, uh, um, uh, do things. He can kind of. Um, 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 run down American institutions. He can refuse to do some of the things, and it's in the paper today, that presidents normally do when there's a change in administration. Um, but I think the biggest he could do damage would be actually is political and cultural, which is we have this tradition in America, which is really important, which is our democracy is passed from one president to the next by some kind of, you know, it could be begrudging, it can be disappointed, it can be angry, but kind of transfer of power where essentially the leaving president says, you know, the whole is greater than me. And I don't think Trump will do that. <laughs> I think he will go into exile saying the election was stolen with a range of grievances, which are increasingly clear. There's no evidence to support any of them and no legal case at all. But I think the, the damage will be that um, many Americans will hear and see that um, and will believe it. And so we will have a country which will be much harder to do big things because um, a Trump in exile who never makes any gestures of American reconciliation post an election, that's a damage. It doesn't mean we don't win the election. We do. But it means like what we get or the ability to govern or the ability to make do things that are difficult because uh, American day. And I think that is the biggest damage. And I think that's likely to happen. So I think we're going to enter in. There, there will not be a um, uh, kind of a shared American sensibility of we are all Americans, um, you know, so. And uh, thank you to Lee for watching both on uh, LinkedIn and on Facebook. And uh, we have lots of other questions and comments coming in here. We won't be able to cover them right now because we want to get to the rest of the paper. But I do want to acknowledge that uh, Therese is watching from Redondo Beach and Rachel Cooper is watching. And she was asking about the global response. And there's a terrific piece in the paper today. The basic headline was um, the world says, welcome back, America, because America had kind of, uh, you know, that America first agenda meant, therefore, that the world is put on a backstage. And the, I mean, of all the crazy things, you know, it's hard to make a top 10 list because the top 10 list would have a hundred things on it, but taking out the United States from the World Health Organization in the middle of a pandemic has got to be one of those top 10 things. And we, one of the things we have seen is that even though he pulled out, they don't, they doesn't actually, uh, you have to give them a year's notice so the good news is that America is still in the World Health Organization and all, uh, all Biden has to do is to cancel that order, I believe, to keep us in the World Health Organization. Chitachi says the issue is that the people who are fearful of a Biden presidency seem to be exhibiting a selfish, sake, scared, uh, uh, rooted in the worst types of isms born out of losing entitled footing. Thank you so much, Chitachi good friend of this show. And Claudia says, hello, Sri from the Upper West Side. Claudia was a guest on this show. And her husband, Andrew Hacker, predicted on this show that uh, Trump would lose the election. And he was right. And then he joined us on Friday night to talk about the election on Thursday night. Uh, and then it was great to see Claudia and Andrew again. So let's uh, keep going with the rest of the paper. Let's see what else is on. Uh, Robert Sam Anson, a bare-knuckled 70s magazine journalist, dies at 75. And uh, note that he wrote a biography of McGovern, the candidate who uh, lost, as uh, we all know, did not become president. And uh, we also had, if you go back in our episodes, by the way, they're all on youtube.com slash you will see that we had uh, one of the obituaries editors of the New York Times, Amy Padnani, on the show a couple a few weeks ago, and she told us a lot about how the paper 
uh, does its obits. We also have Neil Gensler. I have a George McGovern story. In 1972, uh, McGovern lost to Nixon, as you mentioned, in a, in a landslide. Um, I was in fourth grade, and um, the fourth grade teacher said, we're going to have a vote today, um, Nixon versus McGovern. And my parents were um, for McGovern, um, against the Vietnam War. Uh, I thought everybody was, because when you're eight years old, you tend to think what your parents are is what everybody is, because what do you know? And uh, I was a little, for their 21 kids in this little suburban New Jersey fourth grade classroom, and of course the teacher, without talking about the issues of the candidates, just said, who are you going to vote for? So it wasn't a particularly good exercise. And uh, first she said McGovern, and I raised my hand. I was very excited. And uh, one other girl in the back of the class raised her hand. There were two hands up. I remember looking around going, for that moment before she said Nixon, I said, I can't believe all these kids don't know who they're voting for. And then she said Nixon, 19 hands shot up in the air. And uh, it was one of those kind of coming of age moments for me. I, we'd gone to a Helen Reddy concert too. Um, uh, so to see the, the biographer of, of a government, uh, it was like one of those moments in politics and in life where you go, oh yeah, like lots of people don't think the way that I think. And so, and, and, and if uh, this is one of the definitive books about McGovern, and so if people want to go back and look at how America might have been different, yeah. if, if <laughs> McGovern had won, no, we had one of those bumper stickers. Don't blame me. I voted for McGovern. <laughs> <laughs> there were not very many of those, but we had one. Oh, uh, and Therese says, "Welcome back, America." Originated a <laughs> tweet from Anne Hidalgo, the mayor of Paris. Oh, wonderful! Great to know that. Thank you. Uh, changing a toxic culture one complaint at a time. The sports section is still so small here. What are your sports interests? Uh, um, I'm, a, I'm a sports guy. I love sports. I'm a um, soccer fan in the Premier League. Tottenham Hotspur. Go Spurs. Um, I'm a New York Knicks basketball fan, which has been a painful um, um, adult life uh, with the Knicks, who I love. I'm a New York Giant football fan. Um, and I am a New York Yankee um, baseball fan. I feel like my years as a Democratic political consultant entitled me to be a Yankee fan because at least when I was a, a kid or in a young adult in those uh, Jeter years when they were winning every year, it felt great. Like he's a big Yankees fan, and so he would uh, love to talk to you about the Yankees, I'm sure. Here's the back cover of the New York Times on the front page is a big ad from CNN that says more Americans got their election week news from CNN than any other source. Uh, uh, and uh, so there's a big ad. The Facts First campaign, I think, was obviously very important during the Trump era. And I hope they'll continue to uh, emphasize that. Uh, here's the Metropolitan cover pining for a Brooklyn club's comeback and a return to the workplace. Uh, yeah, let's on, on that, a pining for a Brooklyn club's comeback. I'm the, uh, you know, I'm not um, uh, on the club. I do. Th I've been thinking a lot about them. Um, I go to, we go to live music a lot. Um, kind of, you know, folk, a whole range of American music, Newport Folk Festival. And I would say one of the things that I really have felt is um, uh, the, the, the loss of in the COVID era is live music and, and going to shows. My wife and I have done it together. And, and um, it feels like one of those things when people say, oh, like what, like these guys, what would you do first when all this is over? That, that to me is kind of like um, one of the first things. That to me feels like more, we haven't been in restaurants, but I, I, going to live music feels much more um, soul reclaiming for me um, than eating. Because I feel like the eating part I've kind of gotten nailed down, um, <laughs> even in the COVID era. <laughs> Well, we all miss uh, live music and live concerts and things like that. Uh, here is the cover of Atlanta, uh, of, uh, of a suburb of Atlanta. The cover is when the virus came for the American dream. Maybe we should all get used to seeing a lot of pictures of Georgia. So maybe that makes it's a prescient cover in that sense. Uh, what we're going to do now is to show a little video that explains how the cover comes together. So that's about a minute 30. We'll give Jeff, a moment to catch his breath and uh, and relax for a minute. And uh, we are live on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube and LinkedIn for another the 15, 20 minutes. So please share with your family and friends. And here we go.
From the New York Times Magazine, this is Behind the Cover. Our cover story this week by Matthew Scherer explores the economic impact of the pandemic on small businesses. It focuses on Buford Highway in Georgia, home to immigrant-owned restaurants and businesses, many of which are now struggling to make ends meet. We assign Nicole Crane, who's based in Atlanta, to photograph the highway. We looked at a huge number of photos that were all very similar. Highways are not the easiest thing to photograph, but we were in the unusual position of trying to actually present it in a way that kind of evoked highways all across the U.S. It was really the details that we were looking at, like the number of cars or where they were placed. The image that we chose for the cover was ultimately made at about 7 p.m. Just as people were turning on the lights to their cars, which we liked having in the image as well. Yeah, that's right. We thought for this particular one that we would want a type treatment that could stand up against all the signage and typography that was already in the image. This is a story about a specific community, but it could also be any stretch of highway in America. Where you would hear similar stories of hardworking people struggling with whether to prioritize personal health or financial well-being. I can't wait to read this. It's going to be a fascinating story, I'm sure. Uh, we're just going to look in, inside the magazine uh, and see what are some of the things that show up here. Uh, how about this very serious question? Is, is aromatherapy real? Where do you come down? 45% say yes, crank up the lavender. And uh, no plain air for me says 53%. Jeff, are you a aromatherapy enthusiast? <laughs> uh, not so much. Therapy enthusiast, but not so much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, let's uh, keep going in, in, in here and see what else is in the magazine. Uh, this is a, my favorite film of 2020, a tiny masterpiece that captures our current mayhem. So what is the name of this? Um, this is uh, the video. This is a, some kind of viral tweet that has about a French snowball fight. So someone on our team will find this and link to it, I'm sure. Uh, and you folks can read it. Let's. We have a very short poem here that I'm going to read. A uh, poem selected by Naomi Shihab Nye. It's uh, called "Landing Here" by Margaret Newton. And across is Greta Thunberg on climate morality. Uh, when it stops snowing in winter and deep cold arrives to crack the ice, we stop hearing the freezing. Then listen for the great horned owls. They forgive one another and begin to mate while the world is frozen. Landing on pine branches as snow falls gently in large flakes. Eventually, she lays an egg. She lays an egg, then ignores the world until it breaks. And uh, that's a poem by Margaret Newton. And uh, I saw that Greta Thunberg had a uh, fun kind of retort to uh, to Donald Trump, who had been critical of her in the past. And um, we're going to. A uh, read for you, uh, Jeff. Uh, we're going to put you on the spot. This is called The Ethicist Column, as you may know, by Kwame Anthony Apaya. And there'll be a question here that I will read. There's no right or wrong answer, but we'd love to hear your thoughts on, on this question. Sure. My wife and I live in a beautiful community in South Carolina, low country, that unfortunately uses the name word plantation in its name. Knowing how offensive the word is and the hurt it causes islanders of color, we joined a group of residents formed to convinced the governing board to replace the word plantation in the name um, uh, with something else. Ultimately, our efforts were unsuccessful. More than 52% respondents voted to keep the name as is. Before the issue arose, we were considering moving to a new home in our community. Now we're not sure we should. Given what we know, is it ethical to buy a home in a community that affirmatively chooses to keep an offensive name? So Jeff, your thoughts on that. We will also say that Rhode Island having failed to con to uh, change its name in previous referendums, did do that this week. Uh, it used to be, the full name, most people don't know, is Rhode Island and uh, plant uh, Rhode Island and uh, Plantation, right? Yeah. And uh, they voted to remove the word plantation from their name, Rhode Island. It's still Rhode Island, but the full name is no longer, the no longer has a word plantation in it. So what is your answer to this question? Well, First, I, I would say, you know, identifying um, what we um, don't know, we don't know. I feel like this has been a period for me um, personally, I think for white people in generally to kind of say um, um, the painfulness in American life, what it must feel like 
for that couple to go to this home that they love in a place, um, you know, named after a um, um, unspeakable horrors. Um, um, first is something, you know, which I just to kind of stay there for a second. Um, I, I, I think in terms of the ethical question that they present, is it um, should they live, continue to live in a place um, that does that? Um, I would say um, it was their decision, of course, whether to live there. Um, there is a Jewish notion, um, um, which is you know important to me, and I, I think frames an ethical thing, which it's not our job to complete the task, but neither are we free to desist from it. And so that we have an ethical responsibility to engage the moment and times we're in. Um, it's not on us to cre to finish the perfect world or the right world, but we're responsible for engaging the work. It sounds like they are engaging the work. So to me, it would feel like um, kind of a, a, a full and ethically responsible choice if they stayed in the home that they lived in and continued working for justice. Um, you know, and I think that is a, it, it's a, I'm glad you brought that up, Shri, because I do think it, um, it raises really important questions because of there's, there's this notion of like, well, for those of us fortunate enough to be well-educated or employed, well, can we create our own little nook of America or educate our children in pods with tutors and will it come for us? And, you know, um, it may not come first for us, but it comes for, um, it does come for everybody. And, and this unbelievably important work of like of um, truly trying to reckon with who we are, um, uh, you know, I think is the is the work of America, um, and I think this summer and what we've kind of lived through was a it was and continues to be really important. That um, it's okay to say that the work is not done at all in certain ways, and that doesn't um, you know that doesn't make us less America or against America. It doesn't make me. I'm any less interested in like waving this flag, which my wife gave me. And I love that flag. And I also um, really um, am part of things that are deeply wrong in America and want to be part of trying to fix them. So I think um, the ethically responsible thing, if, if the family's able, um, would be to stay and, and do the work and try to do the work. Remind us of the full saying again, please. Well, it's from, it's from Hillel, um, and I'm paraphrasing, um, but it's... Um, um, it is not, you are not required to complete the work, um, but nor are you um, uh, free to walk away from it. Some people will say that that's how you, we should approach Facebook. Uh, instead of just walking away, hold Facebook accountable for uh, what it's doing. Uh, folks, we uh, have just a few minutes left, but I want to tell you that uh, Sundays are busy days around here at DigiMentors. Our team does this show. And then at 11 a.m. Eastern, after a little break, we do She's On Call, a fabulous show with two surgeons, Sujana Chandrasekhar and Marina Kurian. And this uh, today's episode, they have two psychiatrists on, uh, including a rare appearance by a male doctor on the show. And everyone, please tune in. You can find this at She's On Call on Facebook, Twitter, and on YouTube. Please follow and please ask your medical questions of these two surgeons and their guests. It is also broadcast on WBAI on Mondays and on Tuesdays, so please check that out. And then tonight is Positivity Night. Uh, I've been using a asterisk with positivity all through my daily COVID show on Sunday nights because there's so much rotten uh, stuff going on in the world. But uh, today we're having a return guest. Sapphire was our guest on episode 64, and she returns on a historic weekend to celebrate and to talk about what's ahead. Sapphire is the author and poet whose book Push was made into the Oscar winning Precious. She is newish on Twitter, so please follow her. Ms. Saf is her Twitter handle. Two S's and two P's, as you can see. So please follow her on Twitter and please join us at 9 p.m. Eastern. She joined us for episode 64 and now it's episode 243, which has been an amazing run uh, I'm so grateful to our team at DigiMentors that makes all of these we're all of these things possible. So uh, please tune in and please be in touch. And then next Sunday, look at this. We have another great guest, Rick Burke, 
the executive editor of STAT, a news website about health, medicine, science, and more. He's a longtime political editor and reporter at the New York Times and former executive editor of Politico. So we're going to have another stab at the discussing all this great political stuff. So please join us as we continue to celebrate five years of the New York Times read along. There's also a chance for us to just thank our uh, New York Times read along staff who do such a great job week in and week out. Neil Parikh, our executive editor uh, and our team behind the scenes. Here they are. Paula Kiger at Big Green Pen, Steve Taylor at Steve DeReeve, Julia Weeks, Julia L. Weeks, and Carla Baranakis at Kabara, and Neil is at Neil Parikh. This is the team that puts together this show, but we do so many shows for other people, live events, virtual events. Please get in touch with us if you'd like to help you, if you'd like us to help you with your virtual events. We'd love to work with you. And with that, let's go back to the paper. And uh, as we wind up our discussion here with Jeff Plout, our guest for today, we're going to actually look at the food section here. There is an onion tart that's legendary uh, that's uh, here on the screen as um, part of the uh, offerings in the New York Times Magazine. What I learned from a legend this is Andre Soltner and his onion tart that he cooked for 34 years at Lutes and is still perfect. Many people won't be familiar with that name anymore, but Lutes was considered one of the best, if not the best, French restaurant in New York. But there was an amusing correction in the New York Times today already. It said the headline should have been 43 years instead of 34 years. So Andre cooked this onion tart, baked this onion tart for her. 43 years at Lutes, a restaurant that closed. Um, it's a long ago iconic restaurant is what it's called. Did you ever dine at Lutes? Uh, I'm not sure I did. I think my wife, who's a foodie, probably did. Um, but um, that tart looks pretty good. Although I guess that's not the one from 43 years ago. Right? <laughs> I hope not. Do you right. remember the Seinfeld <laughs> where somebody <laughs> bought uh, a JFK's wedding cake or inaugural cake? Many, a slice of it was available for sale on, on an auction or something like that. So uh, I, I'm one of those people who believe everything in life is in Seinfeld. Uh, yes, you just have to find the episode, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And uh, by the way, the onion tart doesn't look too complicated, at least ingredients-wise. Uh, let's keep going. The hard times, uh, the patient sorrowful optimism of the American folk masters uh, is in here. There's also an ad for... Why, are you a wine drinker? Look at all these wine ads in here. Uh, a little bit of Chardonnay. Um, um, I, I, I will. And New Jersey just as as I'm um, just passed um, legalized marijuana, so within the next year, that you know could be Chardonnay and uh, you know a joint, I guess, but not not until quite until that happens. So, when the virus came for the American dream, this is that story we looked at. And um, and uh, thank you for everybody who is sending in these great comments. We're so grateful. I see my friend Nikhil Bojwani says, congrats on five years, Sri. You're certainly doing your bit to keep up the good fight. Yeah, thank you so much, Nikhil. We we'll truly appreciate you. Therese says, thank you so much, Jeff. Truly inspiring. Uh, and I see Jewish expressions, justice, 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 shall you pursue? And if not now, when beautifully put, and um, uh, and just great. Chitachi says, that's awesome that we have Sapphire on. Great, uh, we're, we're looking forward to having her on. And uh, Ellen says, you all do a great job. So interesting, so informative. What wouldn't have gotten through these weeks without you all. So kind, thank you very much, Ellen, for saying that. Really appreciate it. And um, so much more to talk about. We only have a few more minutes. Um, what, where, where would you like to go in the paper? You get to pick. Oh. Uh, you know, I'd go back towards one of the political things, if you have it there. Sure. Election 2020. Let's sure. do it. Yeah. A nation holds its breath as the tally grinds on. The margins are razor thin in crucial states. What right. were... I, I was struck. I know it's not the most important thing, but I was struck at how skillful the TV personalities have become with the maps, <laughs> I feel like <laughs> over the four days, they got better and better and better. It's like, wow, they've gotten quite good at them. <laughs> These are the two two of the guys you were talking about, right. uh, John King and Steve Karnacki. Yes. Uh, they had Bill Hemmer over on Fox as well. Chart throbs, they're called. Geeky, tired, and winning viewers over. 
that was one of the things that certainly a lot of people noticed. You know, uh, sure, one, one thing just on the calls too, which I don't want to dwell here, but interesting, you know, Fox News made the earliest Arizona call. Um, and I thought, and, and they made the, you know, yesterday they, they, they finally did say yesterday that Biden has won too. And I think both of those things are important um, um, of, you know, and we could have a whole, um, as I'm sure you did kind of uh, the media and how we're getting news. But um, I, I thought that was kind of an interesting, um, you know, twist at the end of this, that Fox made the first Arizona call and then joined in yesterday with the, with the Biden call. I think that's important. I mean, there, there are people, many Americans who really just go to Fox news um, for their news and for, you know, important for Fox to say what, what, what is the actual news, which Biden has won, which he, which he has, but maybe it's a sign of our times that I'm saying that's something worth noting and kind of commenting on, but I think it is. I, I completely agree that it, it was an important uh, moment. I, I, I think they called it too early because as we have seen, yeah. uh, I mean, it may, it may still go uh, to Biden, but it felt like the, it was an early call. Uh, one question about Stacey Abrams. Do you know why she didn't run for Senate? Uh, I think she probably wants to run for governor. And I think there's a, and I don't know this to be true, but in politics, after you've had a loss, even a close one, you have to be very careful about the next choice for running for office. You know, she's obviously created a um, tremendous, her fair fight in Georgia and um, uh, working on issues of voter suppression and uh, franchisement have been phenomenal. Um, but from a political you know, electoral perspective, um, especially when you have kind of a historic effort, but you lose, which she did, you got to be really, really careful about the next choice. Because if you lose the second one, then it becomes more of like, oh, this is obviously a phenomenal person, but maybe not in the election game. So I think you'll see Stacey Abrams again running for office, I suspect for governor of Georgia. Uh, my daughter uh, has texted me. She's our political expert in the House. She says that she's taking a breather, uh, Stacey Abrams is, and working on voting rights. Because part of the reason she lost that election, we know, was a voter suppression by the Republican camp. And over here, uh, one of the people who is in this runoff is David Perdue. Uh, he's the one who made fun of Kamala Harris's name and launched the my name is, hashtag my name is, uh, you know, impromptu uh, viral set of memes that came out, people talking about uh, their name and uh, and being made. Well, I said I was I used to get made fun of by little white boys in New York with my first name and last name. And here was a sitting senator making fun of his own colleague's name, a name that he uh, would have certainly had to say multiple times. And Someone had a great post yesterday saying, don't worry, now all you have to do is say, Madam Vice President. <laughs> that's, that's great, right. I hope he loses. Yeah. Um, let's see here, more politics. Biden drafts plans for White House staffing. Do you have any insights or guesses on who some cabinet members might be? Um, uh, well, um, not a whole lot. I know the campaign manager... Uh, Jan O'Malley Dillon, who's a, a friend of mine um, and, um, and a friend of the family, um, I, I think will go in um, or should go into government um, in some uh, very high role. Um, the, I know more of the, the kind of the political people. Um, um, and, and I think Biden will have to balance and figure out, you know, uh, presidents like people loyal to them. Um, the party obviously opened up in huge ways. Um, the importance of African American voters and him, and he said he wants a government that um, looks like the country. And Shri, I think you know your kind of comments, which are you know painful to hear, but like how American we need to see. We, you know, the first thing we need to do is see each other, um, um, and until we do that, um, you know, we're not going to be able to respond to each other. And I think having a government which looks like America is going to be really, really important because. You know, we've learned that, you know, um, in the Trump era, every time you, you know, you see a tweet or you turn on the TV, or it's like, well, who is our government? And so I think that you'll see a, um, uh, a broad swath. I think also Biden will need to be mindful and, and uh, Senator Harris, uh, Vice President-elect Harris, will be really important. I think, I think there is a desire to see new faces. 
um, not you know, just different faces, new faces, younger faces. And I think he's got to kind of balance that with we have really huge problems in bringing in people who are experienced and, and, and know things and help on COVID and these deep American problems with, the, with, a, with a tremendous desire. Um, I think a generational shift in America to see, to start seeing young people. And so as an older president, I think that's going to be an important element for Biden too. I thank you. I, I see the news that Seymour Topping, one of my former colleagues at Columbia Journalism School, uh, a, uh, a leading New York Times editor, legendary editor, he has passed away at the age of 98. Uh, he was also the administrator of the Pulitzer Prizes, and that's how I got to know him at Columbia. He uh, helped put the Pulitzer Prizes online. Our friend Andrew Lee, uh, co-founder of my company, uh, we were both teaching at Columbia, and Andrew worked on the Pulitzer Prizes and put them online back in 95. And uh, he succeeded A.M. Rosenthal, uh, whose son, a uh, Andy Rosenthal, was a guest on this show just a few weeks ago. Uh, and there's a picture of uh, Seymour Topping, uh, Cy Topping. Just uh, very sad to see that. My best wishes to the family. And thank you, Carla, for pointing this out. This be became... Uh, the uh, this obit came out online today, so it isn't in the print paper uh, today. And uh, he uh, was a speaker at a Saja South Asian Journalists Association event back in '97, explaining how the Pulitzer Prizes came together, and it was uh, very uh, helpful to so many people to understand it. And here's a a great photo: New York Times employees in the Saigon Bureau in 1965, Peter Gross, Mr. Topping in the middle there, and uh, Nguyen Ngoc Rao and Jack Languth are, um, and then more than a decade later, Mr. Topping became the first American correspondent in Vietnam since World War II, covering, um, oh, a decade earlier, of course, he became covering that war. And uh, um, so he was a wonderful, colleague and just a nice guy. And uh, and that the photograph there is from Audrey Topping, his wife, uh, who we also got to know at Columbia. Uh, we were together for probably a dozen years. And um, uh, there he is. Uh, great photos of him. I wonder if they have a photo in later years as well. Neil, if you're scrolling down, I don't know if that's... There he is. That's the, that's the Seymour Topping that I remember. He taught there for a year, uh, for a decade at work at the Pulitzers for a decade. And uh, that's how I got to meet him at that age. I think we may have arrived at the at Columbia at the same time in 1992, I believe. So uh, with that, Jeff, uh, we are almost out of time. I wanted to uh, get some final thoughts from you as we start to wrap up here. Yeah, I, um, I think the kind of I'm telling myself, and I guess um, is to try to, um, I think for those of us who have political lives, I think, there is a need to fully embrace not only the bad or worst things that happen, but the really positive ones. And to kind of, um, I love the you know the glass is half full um, in, in this moment, and I do think there, all our problems will be with us. But I do think celebrating this moment, um, uh, you know, a moment of American decency, Amer Amer a, a moment where America, uh, through Vice President Elect Harris, has, has said that. Um, um, we are a broad, robust country, um, and we see ourselves um, with all different kinds of names um, and all kinds of different kinds of um, people. And I do think it is a moment for, for a moment or a time for, um, you know, a, perhaps a calm, um, mature American celebration or perhaps not, but for, for American kind of celebration. Um, or Because it's hard to sustain this kind of work, this kind of involvement. And... Um, we, we are in a very, very special moment. Yesterday was a important day. Which all of us will remember where we were when we heard that Joe Biden and Kamala Harris are the president and vice president elect. And it's um, really delightful to be with you to be able to talk about this today. So thank you. I, I wanted to uh, ask whether it, it made a difference that it, it, it took those four three, four days to make it happen, would it have been different if it had been a blue wave and been announced on late night on Tuesday uh, itself or, you know, Wednesday at two in the morning? Um, I think the catharsis that people felt may have been a little different. What do you think? 
Yeah, I, I think so. And I also made us made me think a lot about, um, you know, America, myself, my place in it. Who, who, who are we? I think it probably led to a, a, more, um, a very more anxious and difficult and more cathartic, but perhaps more thoughtful in some ways of actually kind of, you know, paying attention to places which had, were for Biden, were not for Biden, were still in doubt and what's going on there. Um, and so um, I think in, um, and now to have this kind of moment, and I think allows us to move forward with, you know, with a degree of um, energy and, and optimism. I am optimistic. Um, I, you know, I think, um, you know, Biden, which I know he believes, which is, you know, um, uh, you know, I don't bet against America. And, uh, um, and, and uh, so you want to see, you know, you want to spin the wheel and see the roulette wheel come up the way you could because you don't bet against America. And yesterday it did. So that's real, you know, pleasure. And I'm trying to just embrace that and stay with it and not go to the next set of elections or the midterms, which is the kind of um, occupational hazard of doing it because it's somewhat, um, you know, it makes you a kind of something of a permanent cynic, cynic which I, my instincts are not to be. So, I'll, I'll just share a story. Yesterday, as we're watching the uh, CNN, they started talking about what are the difficulties Kamala Harris is going to have negotiating the left and the, you know, the the, yeah. the extreme left of the party, et cetera, and how will she do four years from now? And my wife, Rupa, says, can we just talk about yeah. what has happened? Forget <laughs> You know, let's not look four years ahead. Let's look now. So I thought that was a, a important moment. Let's look at some of the other comments coming in here. Uh, Laura says, "Big learning for, of 2020 for me. We all have political lives. We owe it to each other to be politically engaged and to advocate for what we believe in. No longer acceptable to say I'm not a political person. That is privileged speaking, and it's not okay. Thank you so much. I believed um, back in." Uh, 2016, the summer of 2016, that was like the summer of 32 in Berlin. And our kids, our grandkids would ask us, what did you do when Trump was coming to power? I didn't think he'd win, but I said, if he wins, this would be the summer of 32. Uh, of course, uh, thank God, you know, it's not a fair comparison to the real horrors that would happen after 32 in Berlin. But we, I felt, I know a lot of people did, that we were on that authoritarian fascist path. And we did not go there because 75 million people voted the right way and 70 million people did not. Rohini says, representation matters. Totally agree. I want to see more Native Americans in government. That is an important issue. Uh, I saw at least, it, maybe it was a Navajo Nation, 97% voted for Joe Biden. So that's really you know the support and the hope that they're having there. In fact, um, I, I was, uh, I became attuned to the Native American issues around COVID because Sapphire, the, who's my guest tonight on our uh, daily program, she said, you know, you're all talking about wash your hands and wear a mask, but in many Native American reservations, there's no running water. So what are you talking about? Wash your hands. And that was, I remember hearing that it was like a blow to me to hear her say that because I had not thought of it that way. Um, and so awareness of Native American issues, I hope, will uh, be something that uh, increases in this era. Let's look at a few more comments. Uh, Mark said, great insight, Jeff. And uh, Jeff, you're wearing the type of cap that are in, uh, sorry, so let's just do Mark first. Mark, thank you for being here. Great uh, part of our community is in Durham, North Carolina. We're still hoping North Carolina can be pulled out for Biden, but I don't think so, right? Yeah. I think it's, uh, the margin is uh, too small. Uh, there or too big uh, on the Trump side, but uh, thank you, Mark, for being here. And uh, Deb, Deb says, uh, uh, Jeff, you're wearing the type of cap our immigrant grandfathers okay. often wore, <laughs> often wore from generation to generation. Does uh, uh, you I'm tired about my bald head, which is look like at, you know, look at this. No, I look at you like a good-looking guy, but I feel like myself. So I, you know, because my kids have been saying you wear that hat because I'm home all the time. <laughs> You're always wearing a hat. I said, you know what? That's just uh, let me do me. <laughs> what, why not a Yankee cap? Yeah, I, I'm. You know, this is a little bit warmer. <laughs> so, uh, why, why not? Exactly. I mean, it works, right? Right. But, I, I, have, but I, like, I will say. Yeah. I do have hair. So. Neil has good hair, though. <laughs> Neil Neil has good hair. What is that kind of cap called, by the way? Do you know? Does anyone know? 
It's a baseball it cap, a uh, Shree. Uh, it's no, a I... baseball. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, uh... yeah. And my, I mean, to Deb, Deborah's comment, my my father and my grandfather did wear hats. So it is kind of um feels like a pass me down um, besides everything else. Um, so we still have uh, several more comments. Carla saying it's a newsboy cap, uh, one way to, to call it. Uh, and, um, you know, we really, it's been a great conversation, uh, Jeff, really appreciate your, your insights. And, and I think that this is what we needed uh, after the celebration uh, from yesterday, really to have a chance to, to think through some of these issues. All eyes now are on Georgia, um, you know, two uh, runoff races, the amount of money, the amount of volunteers, the the advertising, uh, any predictions, any thoughts? Um, well, I'm, it's going to be a fascinating thing. I think there's huge questions about does this high turnout kind of exist? Um, um, does the kind of coming close? Georgia's been, you know, has been a Republican stronghold um, as part of the South. We, we get closer and closer. Um, uh, I, you know, um, I and many, many others are going to be there kind of um, doing the work. It's going to be a very, um, traditionally runoff elections have been lower turnout than the one right before them. Um, uh, that's kind of the, uh, the pattern, if you will. Although I will also say traditionally um, vote by mail and, and, um, and paper voting has also been more Republican. One of the kind of fascinating things, um, you know, that Trump kind of was so against the mail. Um, um, so, you know, I, I think it's going to be a very, very, hard fought election. And I'm looking forward to trying to be helpful to Democrats. I know many others are, but, um, um, you know, we're just going to have to kind of go there and see. It's a, it's a big task for the Democrats to win two races in the same time where we haven't won recently, but we have exciting candidates and, um, um, you know, it's time to get down to it, I guess. I, I think it's a lesson in hat uh, terminology yes. from Jonathan Burstein, who is our expert on this. So he says that's a flat cap because a newsboy cap has more room on the back and on the side. So uh, that's what he's saying. They're a little looser, the newsboy cap. So this is he's saying is a fab, is, is a uh, is a flat cap is what he's calling it. Mark Mark was thinking it might be, a I think it's Kangol with an L, which was a uh, style L Cool J uh, really uh, uh, brought that to the fore back in the day. Uh, 90s, I'm thinking, uh, late 80s, 90s. But for what it's worth, this was one of the most interesting uh, threads that we had in the show, the discussion about caps. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Nick's um, thankful for the time it took to be thorough and honest uh, uh, and great insights here. And Therese is telling us that six Native Americans will be in the new House of Representatives. I presume that's a record. Someone can correct us if that's several. Not. Several from uh, New Mexico. In fact, the entire New Mexico delegation is uh, uh, women of color, uh, which I think is really, uh, really interesting and, and says a lot about where our country is going. Um, so and, more uh, Republican women uh, than in the in past years have been elected yeah. House of uh, House of Representatives. Uh, I think I think we need to close the discussion. I think that Deborah has the <laughs> mic drop comment. Great way to cap off our discussion, right? <laughs> All right. Thank you, Jeff. Yep. Really appreciate you. Uh, everyone, join us next Sunday for Rick Burke, who is a phenomenal guest, uh, journalist. He can talk about the coronavirus coverage as well as politics. So he can do both of those. Uh, and he's our guest at 8 30 a.m. next Sunday. So please be with us for that. And then tonight, please join me 9 p.m. Eastern. Sapphire, the author whose book, uh, whose book Push became the Oscar winning movie Precious will be with us. Uh, that's tonight. Uh, please join us on all these social media channels and then join us next Sunday at 8.30 a.m. Eastern for Rick Burke and then join us at 11 a.m. today, 11 a.m. today for She's On Call with Dr. Sujana Chandrasekhar and Marina Kurian. That's it, folks. Uh, we'll say goodbye and thank you, Jeff. You were awesome. And, thank and you. of course, as the executive producer, I sometimes take license. Go Yankees. <laughs> <laughs> and big thanks thank to you. our sponsors and our team. Thank you. Absolutely. Everyone. All right. Bye-bye, everyone.